This two-day international conference is intended to provide a platform for a scholarly debate among academicians, lawyers, experts, policy makers, and students. It is also intended that the scholarly papers presented in the conference be published in the form of an edited book. A hearty welcome to all the participants and speakers to the simple way to acknowledge God is through prayer. So let us begin this inaugural ceremony by seeking the blessings of the Almighty with an invocation song. I request Aarti and you to invoke the blessings. In the year 1944, the Chicago Convention was signed, and 
the five freedoms of the fair were given to the members of the international community. And to this date, members of the international community were not prepared to accept all the five freedoms of the fair. Majority of them have accepted only the first two freedoms to fly without the landing and landing for non traffic purposes. Then, of course, the terrorism, the development of terrorism was a great task and a hacking of airplanes had taken place. And it has to be contained and conventions have been adopted. And then, of course, again, accidents used to take place in different parts of the world. Then the members of the international community were unanimous in adopting a convention on liability. In addition to this, there were problems relating to astronauts. The Treaty of the Moon were adopted, and we are celebrating the 40th year of the Treaty of the Moon this day. In circumstances such as this, both air as well as space law grew beyond human expectations. Achievements were taking place, when scientific inventions were taking place around the world, they had to be put into conventions for the development and purpose of humanity. Ultimately, it should serve the people. Inventions, if it is not going to serve the people, if any invention is not worth the name or the title. In circumstances such as this, all members of the community were unanimous in having a few resolutions as well as conventions. In addition to this, the aviation industry has been facing a series of problems. Although the aviation industry in the recent past has been providing employment opportunities to most of the people, it has its own problems. Now these are a few major issues. In addition to this, there will be commercialization of space. In addition to the commercialization of space, we have the problems related to space deliveries. In order to discuss the latest law on this subject and what should be done with it, what kind of resolutions are to be adopted, we felt that a conference of this type is to be When we convened the conference, this conference is convened under the auspices of the PG Diploma of Air and Space Law. The CMR industry is the first of its kind, especially in the South, to have a PG diploma program on this subject. And to deliver it and to crash of issues, we have eminent scholars, both in the industry and academics, have come uh, to this world. Now we have people like Dr. Sandeep Mabhat, who is a professor of space law at the National Law University in Calcutta. And simultaneously, we have a wing commander, Dr. J. Sanjay. He is a professor of air and space law, a kid professor of air and space law at the NASA University. And these are the people who are with us in the last three days here and who are training our people who have taken up the PG diploma course. In the events ahead, we may introduce a program, a master's degree in air and space law. If God willing. Now, with this quick introduction, it is my sincere duty to welcome the gathering. On behalf of the CMR School of Legal Studies and the CMR Group of Institutions, and on behalf of our chairman, I give it a great privilege to welcome Dr. G.S. Sitzleber, a resource person and a guest of honor for the inaugural session. Dr. G.S. Sitzleber happened to be a professor of space law, a general professor of space law at the School of International Studies in Jawaharlal University. The wing commander thereafter was appointed as an agent professor at the Nasar University in National Law School of Hyderabad. And he is also a visiting faculty at the Respect of National University of Political Sciences. And his contribution as an academic scholar, being a wing commander himself, is immense. He has wonderful publications. He has published a series of books. The latest one of them is going to be released uh, when the chief guest comes uh, here. Now, in addition to that, I need to take a to introduce you, sir. On behalf of the university, I welcome you. And I request <laughs> the honorable chairman, 
conduct over the last century. And it has come a long way from where it started. If it's a public air law, it started with Chicago Convention, and if it's private air law, it started with the Warsaw Convention. We have come a long way. We have amended the Constitution uh, conventions in lots of uh, ways and with protocols. But what exactly is our main problem today? If I take air law, that relates to the new entry of drones or the unmanned aerial vehicles. Today, unmanned aerial vehicles are being used for defense and are also being used for civil purposes. I'm using the word being used. If not, perhaps in India as a hobby, but other countries are using UAVs in many different ways, even for spying. What exactly happens is, the UAVs, or what we call as drones, have to share the same airspace which we have for the aircraft. And that becomes a problem. The traffic control of UAVs, which are without any pilot within the cockpit, is a problem. The problem becomes accentuated because the pilots who fly the aircraft have a certain duty, and the duty is to see and avoid accidents. They are given normally a 360 degree machine and they are supposed to look out for any sort of obstructions or any even burdens. What it would be if at all we have to integrate aerial traffic, our existing aircraft with UAVs, it's going to be a challenge. And that is the challenge air scholars must accept today as to how we are going to do it. As at present, the restricted areas are flying for UAVs are not enough, neither for their fulfillment nor their actual purpose and cause. So what we need is look beyond how to integrate because common airspace has to be used and there are different ways of flight safety with aircraft and with vehicles. Now coming to space law, this is a very young subject of just 50 years. But in 50 years, this space law and the subject has matured so much that today we have treaties which are not only respected, but some of the principles are created which international scholars would know are being treated as just communists. They are respected today. They are imperative. And you can't change them. Nor can you defy them. They have not started as a small treaty of nine clauses. Outer Space Treaty, popularly called as Outer Space Treaty. It has grown, it has developed, and we have given, we means the scholars have given a lot of interpretation, interpretation to the various clauses. Some have really blossomed very well, but there are some clauses which have become irrelevant. If I were to mention one clause which has not remained as relevant as when it started, is the status of the astronauts as envoys of mankind. Today we don't treat them so. Many other conventions don't give them that status. Right, developing from all that, technology has taken a major lead in space. And today we have reached a stage where a lot of commercial uses of outer space
space, seen freezing. Space travel has started on what I mean is commercial space travel, where there are fair paid passengers who want to go to the outer space, whether for research or for pleasure. And we are also developing what we call as a tourism center. Concepts are there and development is all. So as of today, tourism or for space tourism is a reality. You can't wish it to But it poses a lot of problems. Problems of migration, problems of travel, problems of contract, problems of liability. And that is where space law scholars or the students who take up space law in the future would need to work on how exactly and what we need to evolve out of whatever little existing provisions we have. Again, as I said, technology has developed and today we have prospected that there is a lot of mineral resources in the outer space which we need for humanity and for the contribution of human civilization on this earth. It may be a difficult process. It may be very expensive to bring them to the earth. But we need them because we have already exhausted most of our mineral resources on the earth itself. We have over -exploited. And where do we look for is outer space which offers us a very wide bounty, a very wide bounty of rare mineral resources. Action is in hand. A lot of work is being done. Prospecting has been done and we know it exists. It's only the technology which will take shape and will come to a stage where we can exploit, use it in C2 or bring it down to the earth for the benefit of humanity. It may be a little long, may not happen tomorrow, but whenever that tomorrow comes, we have to be prepared for that. Our problem basically is we are not prepared how to handle commercial exploitation of outer space. And that exactly where we need to devote a lot more attention. The third prospect which we have is we have people who are keen to visit other planets. And not only they are keen, they are even keen to buy one way ticket and they wish to stay there. Whether you have Iscardians or you have the Church of Scientology or various other people, even individuals, they want to establish on the outer space celestial bodies like Moon. There is already a concept which has been made called the Warner's Village. Warner is a scholar and a scientist at NASA. He has created a blueprint as to how a self-contained, self-supporting, self-sufficient small village can be set up on the moon. We have the blueprints for the Mars core. And by the time we reach Mars, I'm sure you would have reached Venus and other places also. If at all, this possibility can be visualized today and becomes technically feasible. In the next two to three decades, we could be traveling, which is interplanetary travel. Now you would appreciate any travel involves some sort of a documentation to know who has moved where, just as we have our passport. Some scholars have suggested, why not have something like a document as inhabitant of the planet Earth? After the first
person who travels outside should be able to show his identity. And since in due course of time we will be traveling to the planet here, these movements have to be recorded somewhere, like to have an immigration or international travel. This is just one problem. There will be many more. But I leave the thought with you all who are interested in space work to look for, think, and evolve solutions because challenges are there and challenges are there. Last year, 
some of the students are here, they can vote for I think, the, uh, the credibility of this uh, the course and I can ensure that aviation and space law are the two best areas at present which are fetching the uh, high level employment for all the, the graduates. So I don't think there is any other area in the law which is fetching that kind of high level employment. Of course, only thing is that we are not very much aware of that, especially because of the reason that uh, in India there is a limited development of space law. Aviation law, of course, there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, and this, this, these opportunities are limited to only few uh, law firms, primarily because of the reason that they are the only firms which are having expertise in this particular field. It is not that actually uh, there is no opportunity available. The problem is that actually the expertise is only with a uh, limited number of the firms and they are getting all these opportunities in the aviation sector. Space law, of course, has developed tremendously in the western part of the world. Uh, especially because the private space activities have kick started in uh, those countries. In India, we are still to have a national space legislation and still to have the, uh, I mean, of course, there are certain private players who are working on the incidental aspects of the space, space activities, but not specifically owning a satellite uh, and uh, carrying on the, uh, the activities uh, uh, independently of any other government agency. So, so we are not finding that kind of activity in India. Therefore, uh, probably we need to wait a little more for the purpose of actually having practical significance of space law in India. But there are lots of opportunities in the western part of the world. There are also firms which are working exclusively in the field of the, the space law in uh, different countries. So, therefore, lots of opportunities are available in both aviation as well as space law. Uh, coming to the issues which are there in both aviation as well as space law, of course, Professor uh, Sakheva has already highlighted certain areas. Let me not touch upon those areas, that are the remaining areas, whatever are there actually. So let me just give a brief introduction uh, uh, as a quick precursor to this uh, conference. As far as the aviation law is concerned, private aviation has uh, played a key role in terms of actually bringing forward multiple legal issues. The privatization of airlines has resulted in competition among the different airlines. Of course, to be more competitive in the market, they have to go for the cost-cutting measures and these cost-cutting measures are seriously hampering the safety in the civil aviation. There are problems in terms of actually uh, not having sufficient fuel, if at all actually the aircraft has to land in some other place because of the weather, weather conditions. Uh, there are problems in terms of how many, I mean I don't know how many of you have actually flown the uh, economy uh, the, the, the class uh, in the aircraft. The seat uh, gap is shrinking down over the period of time. Right? They, they want to accommodate more people and ultimately actually they are compromising on uh, different aspects, safety, convenience, consumer satisfaction, etc. etc. So this is all bringing forward different kind of legal issues. Then privatization of airports, even that is another important thing which is going on at present. Public-private partnerships and maybe over the period of time complete privatization of the airport. This would definitely bring forward multiple other legal issues over the period of time in India. Next, uh, he has already spoken about the unmanned aerial vehicles. He spoke about actually the uh, one aspect of the unmanned aerial vehicles. There are two other aspects. One is the privacy concern and the second one is actually the security concern. These unmanned aerial vehicles would be randomly used in the different airspace and that's every possibility of actually posing security threat to the, the people who would be flown over by these unmanned aerial vehicles or the withdrawals. Then, we also have uh, issues in terms of impact of aviation on environment. Aviation is contributing significantly in terms of environmental damage. So uh, not just the air pollution but also even in terms of the sound. Right? So that also actually the uh, law of environmental impact which is happening out of the aviation industry. So with the increase in the aviation industry it is going to increase further. So how to tackle that is also another important issue. Again, we have the problems regarding financing the aircrafts. It involves huge investment. And there are only a couple of major players at the international level who are actually uh, involved in the construction of the aircraft. Boeing and the Airbus, if I have to tell, these are the two major uh, 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 companies which are actually producing the aircraft at the international level. Of course, the smaller other uh, air, aircraft companies have come into existence, but the major production of the big aircrafts are done by the Boeing and uh, Airbus. And these industries do require the state support in the form of subsidy. There are lots of subsidies given to both Boeing as well as Airbus by uh, uh, UK as well as actually uh, uh, United States. Problem is whether these subsidies are justifiable in the WHO. We have a SCA 
subsidies and not only measure settlement under the, the WT. So can these kind of uh, subsidies be justified under the subsidies and not only measure settlement is a very limited issue. So therefore, these are the multi-dimensional things which you can find uh, in the, the field of aviation. And, and one more thing which I can tell you is about the uh, roadworthy aircraft or the so-called flying cars which are all being experimented at present. So what are the legal uh, implications of these flying the cars in the, maybe the next uh, one decade or so? So that is something to be uh, the problem. So that's very interesting area to look into in the field of aviation now. Uh, as far as the space law is concerned, I have no hesitation in saying that this is going to be the law of the century. Space law is going to be the law of the century, I repeat. This is because there are multi-dimensional issues which are going on in different aspects of the space activities. Right? So, there are multiple things. What has started as a state-oriented activity has now shifted to the private sector-oriented activity. We have a lot of private investments in the space sector. This has resulted in uh, problems in terms of actually the monopoly rights which may be established by the private players. Because as uh, Professor Kreva has already pointed out, there are companies who are thinking in terms of mining of the resources in our space. Can there be positive individual rights being granted, property rights being granted for those mining of the resources, especially which are considered to be the common resources for the of time? That is really important. Space tourism has kick started, uh, and even human habitation in our space, that is also another plan which is going on. Multiple issues with respect to the responsibility. With respect to the rescue and uh, the return of actually those kind of other uh, space tourists, or maybe actually the, uh, the people who will be habitating the outer space and celestial bodies have talked up uh, over the period of time. We have issues of IP in outer space. We know that International Space Station has been constructed primarily for the purpose of carrying on different research. Now, the question is whether these research or the inventions which are conducted in the outer space are patentable. If it is patentable, who is going to grant a patent? Is it the country to which the astronaut belongs or the researcher belongs? Or is it the country to which the space station belongs? Who is going to grant the patent? Second, if an earthly invention which has been patented, if it is infringed in outer space, in the International Space Station, who has the jurisdiction to try those kind of infringements? Whose law should be applicable for the purpose of actually trying those infringements? All these uh, things are not settled as of now. So that's uh, another major area which is coming up for the purpose of a, a, a resolution uh, in the recent past. Uh, we also have issues like environmental protection in outer space, demilitarization of outer space, de-weaponization of outer space, which is continuing since the beginning. Since 1950s, 1960s, when the space treaties are entered, since then these issues are continuing and they have not been settled until now. So we have issues with the, the de-weaponization, uh, environmental uh, protection in outer space, etc. And added to this, there are multi billion worth issues in terms of the space financing, private space financing, because each space activity would require a few billion dollars. So there will be investments from different sectors. There will be issues in terms of liability. If at all actually these satellites all were actually some uh, property and cause damage to the extent of, I mean, few billion, billion dollars, how exactly that has to be settled? And also insurance uh, settlements. Space insurance settlement. So all these are the multi-billion worth uh, issues. And uh, if a lawyer is expert in this particular field, even the one percent of this will uh, do uh, the, I mean entire earning of his uh, the lifetime. So that's the kind of uh, situation with respect to these multi-billion uh, uh, worth issues. Uh, at the same point of time, there are also national space legislation which are developing in different uh, the states. Uh, the developed states, uh, space foreign nations have already started handling the legislation. But unfortunately, they are all not harmonized, uncoordinated, and we are having actually diversification of the laws in different countries. So we need to harmonize it. We need to have certain kind of the laws in the municipal level, which are almost uniform, so that actually there will not be any kind of a chaos, there will not be any kind of a confusion in the space activities uh, in the years to come. So these are all the multidimensional issues, and uh, 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 I mean, I'm sure that actually you already got to know about actually so many issues which are prevailing in both aviation as well as the space sector. And that's why this conference is definitely a, a, a timely uh, uh, event. And in uh, the next, I mean, today and tomorrow, uh, all of you will definitely enjoy uh, the presentations which will be made by different uh, the speakers. And I'm sure that you'll be going back as a better knowledge person. And of course, including me, you also encourage me. So we will all be going back as a better knowledge person in, the, uh, in these two days. Thank you very much.
brightness, warmth, and the start of something new. I kindly request our Honorable Chief Guest, Padmashri Dr. Aran Vatika, and all our esteemed dignitaries to inaugurate the conference by lighting the lamp.
those who are going to be mentored and also the people who will do the you know, mentoring job properly. So first and foremost, let me say that from the engineering background, I will speak to you. So my first contact with uh, the law related thing started with the Apple program. And at that time, the, you know, we had the law department office or the law office in Chennai for clearing our contracts and other things. Where we had our own supplies to abroad. We have to go through the contract properly so it will be vetted by them. Then, about some value to go to Delhi, long history. So, we went through all that process. But one major component was costing close to $1 million out of this uh, 22 items, space quality items from the US. And you know the difficulties of getting export license from the US was far more than even in those days also. Now, also it is continuing, but uh, it is so difficult. Something called OMC, you know, Office of Emissions Control which will be the State Department, NASA, and also the U.S. Department of Defense, and then the U.S. Department of Commerce. So all the four will get the files, together they will make a decision. So the persons who separate that item, they were from Broughton Whitney, and the Hamilton Standard Division in Connecticut. So the marketing manager who had come to India, we went through all the things, then we have to get the clearance for government of India for this and also for the, anything above 8 lakhs it has to be cleared by our Department of Space and the Space Commission. The Department of Expenditure Secretary will be the number, exhibition number, and he has to clear this file. So all these hands, you know, we were just having only not even 30 months total program file and told you about money and I had post about 14 project managers and 2,500 engineers all down from Indian Education Institution. And the average age of my team was 27, I was 37 years old at that time. And my goal was selling below 100 rupees per salary. So I think it was more the value of that money. So when we did all this, the contract here, by the time we went to law ministry, that day one manager landed from Calcutta to ITC, where we were crossing the ITC building on the day. So there he, just with the suitcase in the office, he said, we will have a meeting. We have a working lunch. And my controller, Uttana, who was the additional chief secretary of the Calcutta State Government, later he was our controller. So we went through. There was one term of the contract is you know, guaranteeing performance of the system, which is called delivery in the market. What do you mean by this? You know, he is a lawyer. What do you mean by delivery in the market? Is all at a defined point, which is a space, which is a volume, you have to tell. Precision is called for. And the second thing is about the, you know, the lift, there is something called the lift off. The rocket is called, the lift up is successful, if it is just one and a half inch above the ground. One and a half inch is above the ground on its own thrust force, you know. It is lifting force by thrust. So these are all things which we went through. So he said, I will enjoy working with you. So that is how he got the clearance by leaving itself. He will lay my flight in return. And then within a week we got the things, surprisingly from US, in spite of all the hurdles, of course, I was explaining to our faculty who was bringing me here that there is something called the lobbies in the US. We won't call it in India in that name, but it happens everywhere. And in 48 hours, we got a clearance for such a big item. But even very small things like capacitors and you know, one detector, we have to spend six months, one year waiting time and all that. So things are not uniformly. Honest and transparent, anywhere, everywhere in the world. I think first and first, that is where the lawyers come to picture. You have to win the case. And that is your job to do. And this is one of the things which we found. That the subsequently, when we built the inside system with Ford Aerospace as the prime contractor, the government of India entrusted the Department of Space to build and operate the inside system. 
the planning commission allocates money from the transport transportation and communication activities from other departments so we are the managing agents of that money so we get all that at that time the 147 there the satellite they fail means we lost the earth we lost the sun we got a black spin then we overcome that back we had our American ground controllers are there with our people. They were in charge and commands went. Finally, we found that there was some proper understanding because the Mr. One had a solar panel on one side and the other side was a solar sail, which is 9 meter long boot and 3 meter long sail, like a topi, you know, that is metalized uh, myla and gala. Those things were there because that didn't deploy. The algorithm which were put on the ground had not been corrected. So, excessive law builder, we got the sun intrusion at the wrong time and moon intrusion also at the wrong time. So, sun and moon joined together to bring down the satellite. At three minutes before the final demise, we restored the satellite. But as we all say, operational success passion is there. But the, you know, this is a lesson which we have learned. But terminal terminal is not about the insurance money. Satellite cost plus the launch cost. And the station was in command in the department of space. So the national insurance company, they have had underwriters all over the world, including Lloyds. Finally, he got another terminal in our back. But that was just sufficient to build the second satellite only. The cost has gone by the time. Launch we have to produce ourselves. So these are things which we have learned, insurance law, and then overflowing you know, territories which are hostile to India. We are not allowed. It can be any time stop and then you know, they will say you are like, uh, carrying things which are explosive in nature and other things. So the right thing we have done. But the most uh, surprising thing which we went through was the Varadhatma uh, Kaswatra was the ambassador in Paris. He later became a seller by Secretary Council. And uh, he has links with family in the country. And uh, that time, Air India was a lot of you know, cargo handling and passenger handling things, only services are used. They used to hire on super rupee aircraft, which is propeller driven, but it is a huge one, which can carry, you know, tanks, which can carry the plants, many things, but it is also a cargo plane. It came from Hong Kong, we took it from here, went to Paris, and from there to Toulouse, all that was okay. Then all tests were done, it has been transported to French Guiana. That time, we again followed the same area under an office. And then they are arranged the super rupee to take off. That time, French DGCA said, No, nothing doing, you cannot land it. No, not allowed. There is something called loan conversion. You know all these legal terms because of these kind of things. And they said that with the, the French government comes in the French overseas territory, only the French national service aircraft only can handle the so we went through nightmare things for two days to get alternate arrangement and finally airplanes, you know, they had a cheaper offer, more comfortable, more safe operations to transport it to French Guard. So what I'm telling, there are things which we as the engineering team in the Indian Space Research Organization, we are never knowing. Yeah, no, ignorance is not an excuse. So we have finally faced the situation. So we did many, many such things everywhere. But what really happens is the DGCA. Also, you know, when we are reporting things from abroad, we have to get a clearance. Sometimes we pay the, you know, in protest we pay the custom duty to retrain later. But some, almost 700 cases, you know, it was pending in DGCA. And there again, the export import you know, procedures of the government of India changes. We are not keeping track of parliament proceedings and many other things. So, this is what I would say. The knowledge of 
law is very very essential. In my later, you know, assignment at Anna University, which is College of Engineering in India and other things. So there, we have two major components of law taught. One is environmental law and another is the environmental property law. Environmental law was handled by Dr. Nagushna, who was the last school. You know, she was also in the Madras University Law Department. Later, she became my chancellor of law university. And there, the other part of the intellectual property, again, it is, you know, interpretations vary. Because the patent culture in the entire world is not uniform. There is an international organization, but it is not uniform. So, which one you are violating, you have to be on guard. Then you can come to the launch point, you know, at the deck of oil, at the launch site, you can stop the launch. That level threat has come to us. We have seen. So, the, this is where I think you know, we don't have a person specializing in law sitting in the Department of Space full time. We take law ministry support, most of the time, the office and then the other, other places. But what do you say? The other part, the deputy management, you know, the providing issues which are now talked about, that the one is on the Space station, you know, I think mean, what has already touched on that thing because it is like a toll tree, you know, who comes, who goes, and then who will regulate the discipline because that is very, very important. You know. Because in the internal space station, there are incidents where one hole was put on the Russian side or something, they said no one hole was drilled. Recently, also, it is still an incident which is to be investigated. So, like that, there are a variety of things which can happen. One long move by any person or any party can bring down the whole system. That is one. And the second is about the, the you know, moon base and the Mars base. Everybody is talking about along with the sky and many others, you know, the Bezos, many others, you know, private investors are coming in and living there. But in all this, finally, the law, the legal framework is of paramount importance. Without that, you can't do anything. Because an incident which occurs can bring, you know, make or mark the entire system. And the other, she was talking about the asteroid mining and, you know, making use of the resources of the asteroids. You know, Japanese have already landed on the asteroid, brought samples to the earth. Variety of things are happening. In India, we are now in the, just initiating the moves for the, you know, Gagamila, where the man played. Originally it was planned for two, now it is changed to three people. So the thing is, the bringing a human being back alive to earth, like what Kennedy said, he was sending a man to the moon, but he never said that bring them back alive. But in India it is a must. We are not doing animal prayers here. I think let us be very, very clear. We are not putting first rats and then monkeys like Americans did. Or uh, you know, like a dog, you know, in Soviet Union, we are going to have only human beings. They are going to be gun knots. So we have to ensure success of that whole thing. So the legally whatever is relevant has to be undertaken with meticulous care and also the plan. You can't leave anything to chance. You know, it has to be 100% of success. And the other part, the space weaponization. So the recent Assad test has been, you know, very badly criticized by somebody, very much appreciated by somebody. There will be always like that. But the thing is, how do you ensure the self-discipline? This is very, very important. Whatever you do, ultimately it is at the taxpayer's money in India. The cost is bound to the taxpayers. So whatever we do, it is not for a circus. And not for a fancy operation, it is for a purpose. If national security is dominant, okay, you do it. But then it has to be convinced by the lawmakers of the country. You know, parliament has to approve such things. Then you cannot be a person who creates mischief in space. Whatever you do, it has to be done. But at the same time, the Space Act. It's just in the national state, it has been adopted, it has been rented by some people. I think we're going to go through soon, maybe in final parliament. 
then we have the economic and some other countries' uh, ideas also. But there is an economic gap, which is not being developed in other countries, and also go through that. That is much more stringent and prohibitive compared to the space act. So the export of any radioactive metal from India is not allowed. So there are variety of things like that. So space act is not the interest of commerce also. So that I think we will have to see. And the other part, on aviation, because I was, you know, running the Anna University, the Madras Institute of Technology Project was the one of the primary goals by the aeronautics which produced Dr. Abdul Kalam. He was a student of the MIT Compact and many, many others. So the point is, such glorious institutions, Golden Jubilee or, you know, many, many other things, 60 years celebration, that is only a symbolic uh, celebration. Now the spirit of doing something has to come. So we are now on the transition stage for the supersonic transport and the hypersonic transport. There are two missile programs for hypersonic thing from BRDO and we have the supersonic uh, things also, you know, some experiments are being done. But you know the difficulties of convincing the international community of lower plate regulations. Aviation law is very, very stringent compared to even space law. And I think the way we have to simulate the aviation itself has got so many constraints. So many are off deals, exchange of operations, and technology is not easily coming by, and material technology especially is much more difficult. So this is another area where we have to think of. But the, what I would say, the reason you might have seen that the, the you know, the first H.A. Industrial Aeronautics was set up at Bangalore by Walter Dhirachan and, you know, was really dug out of place for second world half time, service, and then subsequently they started building things. H.A. 24 was, it was just conceived, built, but it never became an operational system. Then we have got now the LCA, which is again going to dominate the things in Spartan strength, and many, many other things will come. But that is in the aviation side. But there are private operators who are doing civil aviation to almost 10 fold, 20 fold increase in the capability of passenger transport and cargo transport. Now, the cargo is a very big thing which has to be handled. And the commercial implications of that uh, being, you know, in this region, the India has an export of many, many things. But our knowledge of the international trade and the international cargo regulations is very, very poor. It can be uploaded anywhere, anytime. And sometimes by mistake, if we land in the wrong airspace, it can be brought down also. So this is another thing. So when we are actually working on my Apple project, Communication started project and you know, the next service and the bringing of IT. That time we didn't have LS, we didn't have the uh, present, you know, all the internet, nothing was there. So we will set only 8 for 8 hours for an international call. So that is the communication level at that time. And in spite of that, we constructed business successfully, did everything, no operation. All the six continents of the world have operations took place. So that is possible. It is the tools and techniques may change, but fundamentals don't. So I think law is firmly grounded on fundamentals. And I wish that this today given will really make you aware of the, the potential and the pitfalls of the legal design that you are handling now. You have to assist. People who are sometimes maybe ignorant also, because the software engineering, you know, as IBM person once told the IBM chief, he set up the software engineering institute at Kalimula, and he said that it is a, you know, it is a product for the ignorant and innocent masses. I think the law has to be helping ignorant and innocent masses and I think it is in your hands. Thank you so much.
you so much, sir, for addressing the gathering. In commemoration of the solemnity of the occasion, Professor Dr. G. S. Ashdeva will be releasing his latest book entitled Space Commercialization, Prospects, Challenges and Way Forward. Professor Dr. G. S. Sachdeva has joined NASA as an adjunct professor. He has an illustrious academic background. He has been a gold medalist in LLB from Nagpur University, Maharashtra, and has vast experience in teaching and research. Dr. Sachdeva has done an MPhil as well as PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. He is also adjunct faculty and guest faculty for Air and Space Law at the Center for International Legal Studies, School of International Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University. He is also em uh, empowered as a teaching resource person for international law and air and space law at the Indian Academy of Diplomacy and International Law under the aegis of the Indian Society of International Law, New Delhi. His early appointments include his appointment as honorary faculty for air law, National Institute of Aviation Management and Research under, under Airports Authority of India, New Delhi. He has also been visiting faculty for environmental law at the Center for Environmental Law, New Delhi. His rich experience as a researcher in international law, especially in international air and space law, has made him a prolific writer. He has authored two books, International Transportation, Law of Carriage by Air, as well as Outer Space, Security and Legal Challenges. He has also written a monograph titled Space Tourism Industry of 21st Century, which has been published by the Foundation for Aviation and Sustainable Tourism, New Delhi, in 1999. I request the chairman and the other eminent dignitaries on the desk to kindly give the honor of the book release.
some of you who are interested in the subject to take benefit. Any comments if you have at any time, my email address is in the board. I welcome that your very good suggestions. Thank you very much. It's, it's slowly it's happening 
I think you got to the this a lot of stuff. I don't know if you go for example. Uh, you know, it is a little bit more like that. At the same time, you know, almost an awful year, uh, yeah, right? And everything they dictate will be the, the command and even the parliament. Uh, most of the time, is not the impression to uh, raise them and uh, uh, give them to the uh, guidelines or whatever it is. You know, these priorities are very most What are the impacts on that and how to keep? Ultimately, whatever is done is for the social uh, benefit. The common man in the country, the common man in the world should be benefited. Any reforms is for the good of the society. If no reforms, uh, if no legislation is there, it's not good for the society. If a common man is not benefited, such laws uh, may not be of great help according to me. And uh, at the same time, uh, uh, you know, this uh, uh, the liability norms under uh, space law. It's uh, you know, such a great such a, such a Thank you. 
the organ is so effectively and efficiently. And I'm sure, uh, as all the additional speakers have mentioned, it's certainly going to be uh, a lot of uh, people will be there. And uh, I'm sure it's going to benefit each and every one of you uh, who participate actively in the conference. Thank you very much. I wish you all the best.